All right. Good morning, everyone. I'd like you to turn, please, in your Bibles to uh, this book of Ruth and chapter four, Ruth chapter four. I'm going to read uh, the first 13 verses of Ruth chapter four. So it begins this way. Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, now the home. your device <clears throat> is connected. Okay. Maybe. We... All right, let's try again. <clears throat> Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, Thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing for to confirm all things a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor and this was a testimony in israel therefore the kinsman said unto boaz buy it for thee so he drew off his shoe and boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people ye are witnesses this day that i have bought all that was elimelech's and all that was Kilian's and marlin's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Marlon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come unto thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And then he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And again, God will bless that reading of his precious word to us. Just kind of a, a review. Uh, our title uh, for this session is Redeemed, a great title. Uh, we often sing it, Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it, Redeemed by the Blood of the Lamb. So we're just going to have that simple title, Redeemed. And it really is a story of redemption, this chapter. But just to kind of set the scene, I want to just kind of review. There's so many different ways that you can look at Ruth. Uh, we can look at it from different aspects. But in chapter one, we saw faith's resolve. And remember in chapter 1, verse 16, that Ruth said, thy God will be my God, thy people will be my people. And so uh, she, she trusted in the God of Israel. And so there was faith's resolve, uh, thy God will be my God. And then in chapter 2, there was faith's response. And we find, uh, Scripture tells us, faith without works is dead. And here she is laboring in the field of Boaz showing evidence of her faith, uh, even casting herself upon an ancient law concerning the, uh, the, the, the gleanings of the field and uh, willing to labor in that way. Faith's response. Chapter three was faith's request. Uh, she believed that the one who had been so gracious to her, she believed that he would give more grace. And so she requests that he would play the part of the kinsman for her. 
And then in this chapter, we come to Faith's reward, and we'll see how blessed she is. Now, as we consider it, we 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 want to just talk about a an old Hebrew word, goel, a little bit, and give a little bit of background. This word goel, G-O-E-L in Hebrew, is translated three different ways in the Old Testament, and they're all going to come out, really, in this story. Uh, the word goel is translated as kinsman. It's translated that way numerous times in this particular book. It's mentioned, for instance, in chapter uh, 2, verse 20. The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. Uh, several times in chapter 3, here again in chapter 4. And so it simply just means uh, a, a kinsman, but also is translated as the word redeemer. Uh, that great confession of Job in the Old Testament. I know that my Redeemer liveth and that on the earth and shall be on the earth in the latter day. And in my flesh, I'll see God. I know my Redeemer liveth. That's again, the word goel. And then it's translated one other way. And that is as the avenger of blood. If you remember the, the cities of refuge were a place that somebody could run away from the avenger of blood. And that word avenger, again, that is used in our Old Testament is a translation of this word goel. And so we want to think a lot about that particular word as we consider this particular chapter. Wonderful thing about the book of Ruth is that although it opens on a very sad note, if you remember back to when we began our study, it be, the opening chapter, you have three funerals. And yet it closes with a wedding and then a birth of a baby. And so we go kind of all the extremes of life, uh, beginning uh, with three funerals, ending with uh, uh, these exciting events of a wedding and then the, the birth of a baby. And so it's just an amazing uh, little uh, book. Uh, also, it's interesting that in chapter one, there's a good deal of weeping recorded for us in that first chapter, but the last chapter resounds with overwhelming joy that comes to the little town of Bethlehem. And we might borrow the words of Psalm 30 and verse 5, which says this, weeping may endure <clears throat> for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And so we've gone from the weeping in the night of Moab in chapter 1, and now to the joy that's coming in the morning here in chapter four. Also, just by way of background information, there's a thing called the Leverett marriage. The uh, spell L-I-V-I-R-A-T-E, Leverett is how I would pronounce it, but I'm told uh, by the dictionary it's Leverett, the Leverett marriage. And often when I would see that, I would have thought in my mind, oh, it's something to do with Levitical law, but it actually is not based on that at all. Uh, it, it's simply from the Latin word levir, L-E-V-I-R, and it means a husband's brother. And so this, uh, this practice prevailed uh, even in patriarchal times, even before the, the giving of the Levitical law, that if someone, uh, someone's husband died, the brother had to play the part, if you like, of raising up an inheritance. And so let's just look at Genesis 38, where we see it for the first time in the patriarch's experience, Genesis 38, verse 8, where this lever at marriage is first referred to. And so in Genesis 38, it says, verse 7, And Ur, Judas' firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. Verse 8, And Judas said to Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. And Onan uh, knew that the she seed should not be his and so on and so forth. We know the rest of the story. It's not a particularly pleasant story that we want to dwell on, but you get this idea that if if somebody uh, husband died, that the brother was to marry the 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 brother's widow and to raise up a seed for them. 
And so Judah calls on Onan to marry his brother Ur's widow. And it, 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 it contemplates just a simple thing. The death of a childless man when his next of kin, speaking broadly, is bound to marry his widow. And so where do we get that in the Pentateuch? Look at Deuteronomy and chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25, where it's enshrined in law, it's found in the patriarchs, but now it's enshrined in the Levitical law. And so Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, if brethren dwell together and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger, her husband's brother shall go in unto her and take her to him to wife and perform the duty of an husband's brother unto her. Another uh, reason uh, that a goel or kinsman redeemer would be required not only to raise up a seed, uh, an inheritance uh, for his deceased brother, uh, but also to redeem lands that had been lost. And if we look at the book of Leviticus in chapter 25, Leviticus 25, because this is all necessary background to this chapter, Leviticus 25 and verse 5, where we read this, it says, that which groweth of its own accord, no, 25, 25, sorry. It says, if thy brother be waxen poor, and hath sold away some of his possession. And if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. So again, somebody gets into financial difficulty, has to sell some of his inheritance, and near kinsman, a brother, has to redeem that land for him. Uh, and again, the whole point of all this is that God was trying to preserve the family not just the family uh, in terms of its, its continuance uh, through a, an offspring, but also concerning its inheritance. And, and so it's very evident that God saw the preservation of the family as a very, very important thing. And by the way, it's a tragedy in a sense that in our culture, the enemy of our souls is doing everything he can to actually destroy the family rather than to preserve the family. But God's word would always seek to preserve the family, to preserve the inheritance, to preserve its offspring and its continuance. And so that is certainly what's entailed here. So concerning this redeemer, uh, this kinsman redeemer, I want to just mention several things about him that is significant. First of all, this kinsman redeemer had to be related. Not everybody could perform the duties of a kinsman redeemer. Uh, he had to be a near kinsman, as we saw in Leviticus 25, 25. Of course, this was a major obstacle to Boaz, as we've already seen in chapter 3, that although he was willing to play the part of the kinsman redeemer, there was a nearer kinsman than him. And so that had to be dealt with, that had to be taken care of. But nevertheless, he had to be a near kinsman. Now, again, when we think about the Lord Jesus, who is basically the fulfillment of the type of the kinsman redeemer, in order to redeem us, he had to become related to us in order to play that role as our redeemer. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 2, and if you've got a Bible marker, you might put it in Hebrews chapter 2. Let's just look there for a second, because uh, I believe that the, the type of kinsman redeemer, the fulfillment of it, is revealed to us here in the epistle to the Hebrews in chapter 2. And so it tells us in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. And two reasons why he did that. That through death he might destroy him that hath the power of death, that is the devil. I want to suggest to you that that's taking the role of the avenger of blood, the goel, that's going to be the avenger of the one who has brought such destruction 
into the family and into society and so that he might destroy him and then verse 15 and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage again that's the part of the kinsman redeemer that he is going to redeem us even from death and the fear of it and so the lord jesus uh, in order to become our kinsman redeemer he became flesh and blood that he might die on the cross that he might redeem us born into the world in human flesh he became our near kinsman and the amazing thing is he will remain our kinsman for all eternity when he took on that additional nature of humanity it was forever and so we often say there's a man in the glory at God's right hand. And that is true. Uh, he took on humanity never to divest himself of it again. And so he being eternally the son uh, took on the additional nature of humanity and became fully man, fully God in order that he might be our kinsman redeemer. What matchless love is that? So he had to be related to play that part of the kinsman. He had to be related. Secondly, he had to be rich. In order to qualify, the kinsman redeemer also had to be able to pay the redemption price. He had to buy back the land that had been lost. He had to, as it were, purchase the, the right of redemption. And, and so Ruth and Naomi were obviously in dire straits. They were poor, too poor to redeem themselves. But Boaz had all the resources necessary to set them free. And when it comes to the redemption of sinners, nobody but the Lord Jesus Christ is rich enough to pay the price. Because indeed, uh, the price of our redemption is not... Uh, by silver and gold, as we know from First Peter chapter one, verse eighteen and nineteen, uh, that's not that that's not can, uh, possible to accomplish our redemption. What's required is the shedding of precious blood. The blood of Christ is the only possible means of our redemption. And so uh, we we read uh, again very familiar words to us, but it's good to our ears to be reminded of these wonderful truths. First epistle of Peter, and chapter 1, verse 18 and 19. We read these, these marvelous words. It says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot and then perhaps one other pertinent scripture is in the book of psalms in psalm 49 psalm 49 again speaking of the cost of redemption and it tells us in verse 5 wherefore should i fear in the days of evil when the iniquity of my heels shall compass me about they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious or costly, and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. Again, it's not wealth that can redeem, it's only the blood of Christ. And of course, we read in Ephesians 1, 17, uh, 7 that we're redeemed through Christ's precious blood because he gave himself for us to purchase us and he purchased an eternal redemption for us at Calvary. So he had to be a near kinsman in order to redeem us. He had to be rich in order to redeem us and he had to be ready. He had to be ready, he had to be willing to redeem us. And we know here in the book of Ruth that there was a kinsman redeemer that was closer to Boaz. But as we shall see this morning, he wasn't willing to redeem. Uh, he was to buy back the land, but he wasn't to uh, play the part of raising up a seed for his brother. And so uh, there has to be this willingness to redeem. 
And so certainly there's a near kinsman here not willing to redeem, uh, even though uh, he was free to purchase both the property and the wife. He wasn't willing to do it. He had the money, but he didn't have the motivation. He was afraid he would jeopardize his own family's inheritance. Of course, the key theme of, of this chapter, chapter four, is, as we've said, redemption. Uh, the word redeem by purchase are all used up to 15 times in this chapter. And again, aren't we thankful that the Lord Jesus not only was rich enough to redeem us, not only did he become related in order to redeem us, but he was ready to redeem us. In fact, he was so ready and willing to redeem us that he, it says, set his face as a flint to go to Calvary to accomplish that work of redemption. And so there can be no redemption without this willingness. And of course, the willingness to pay a price. From our perspective, salvation is free. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But from God's point of view, redemption was a very costly thing. One more thing about this kinsman redeemer. Related, ready, uh, he had to be uh, rich. But <clears throat> there's another aspect. Remember we said this word goel, it's also translated as avenger of blood and we need to remind ourselves the lord jesus has come to redeem us at great price but he's also come to avenge avengers and the one who has brought such damage into this world into families brought death into the all of these things the enemy the lord jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil and in a coming day, he is going to be the avenger of blood. And he is going to crush Satan under his feet. What a day that will be, be when the Lord Jesus comes to destroy the enemy. So in verses 1 through 12, which we read together, we want to look at the theme of the business of the, at the gate. Just to give an outline, verses 1 through 12 when I look at the business of the gate at the gate, which was very important business that had to be conducted. And then verse 13 through 17, we're going to look at the birth of a grandson. And then verse 18 through 22, the blessing of the genealogy. So that's our little outline. Business at the gate, birth of a grandson, the blessing of the genealogy. So the business at the gate. Notice that Boaz lost no time. It says, then went Boaz up to the gate. Right after the, the memorable night scenes that we saw, Ruth is sent home with her, her, uh, her as it were, bounty uh, that she had carried back. And immediately Boaz goes up to the gate. He goes there losing no time. The matter of hand was urgent. And he waited, made his way in the morning hour to the gate to the town. Now, again, the city gate, very important place. It was the place where uh, the transactions took place. It was a place where issues were judged. It was a very significant place in the, the life of the cities of Judaism. It, it was where a lot of judgments took place. And so business transactions were agreed here, disputes were settled, a place where one could expect justice and right judgment. Again, look back with me, please, to the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 16, a very pertinent scripture uh, concerning the matters that we're considering this morning. It says in Deuteronomy 16, verse 18, judges and officers shalt thou make thee in all thy gates which the Lord thy God giveth thee throughout thy tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. So the gates became a, a place of great significance. It's where issues were dealt with. Remember when Solomon stole the hearts of the people, what did he do? He went and sat in the gate. Remember Sodom, 
uh, and how Lot uh, initially pitched his tent towards Sodom, but he ended up sitting in the gate, Genesis 19, verse 1. He became part of the legal establishment of the city of, of Sodom. And so it is a very significant place. And it's a sad place, too, because although it's a place where justice should take place, it's interesting that in Psalm 69 and verse 12, concerning the Messiah, this is what it says. They that sit in the gate speak against me. And isn't it tragic that the ones who were meant to be the dispensers of justice, when God's Messiah came, those that sat in the gate spoke against him. The, the, the religious leaders, the, uh, the civil authorities, they had no time for God's Redeemer when he finally came into this world. They spoke against him. Now, what's interesting is Boaz goes up to the gate. He sat down there and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by. Now, again, just the providence of God here, uh, that he just happened to come by as Boaz is sat in the gate, the very man that he wanted to see. He, he comes by and notice it's, it, it doesn't give us a name for this kinsman of whom Boaz spake, he came by, and whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Now, here's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's unthinkable that Boaz didn't know the name of his kinsman. But for some reason, his name is never given. It may well be that the writer of the book of Ruth uh, deliberately withheld his name, concealing the identity of the man because of his reluctance uh, to, to take Ruth the Moabitess to be uh, his wife, uh, who refused to redeem, uh, refused to take the place of the kinsman redeemer. And it's significant that this unwilling kinsman who was so concerned about preserving his inheritance, and yet for all eternity, his name is destined for oblivion. Nobody knows who he is. He's so concerned about his reputation and his inheritance, and yet he's destined to be unknown throughout all eternity when not told who he is. Notice, too, in verse 2, he took 10 men, of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And they sat down. Number 10, interesting. Uh, it's symbolic of completeness uh, and was required uh, for a legal assembly. Uh, it was interesting. It was required for a synagogue. You couldn't, you couldn't have a synagogue without 10 men. It, it was required uh, in uh, any kind of ceremony, giving it official character. The minimum required uh, was 10. Uh, and it prevails to the Jews even to this day. That's why, by the way, in Philippi, uh, there was a prayer meeting by the riverside. There wasn't a synagogue because there weren't 10 men who could make up the required number. And so this is a requirement to have these 10 witnesses to constitute this legal transaction of these events. Now, I want you to notice, too, that I don't know if you've noticed it, but in those two verses, a number of times it talks about sitting down. So verse one, when then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down and there and behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by unto whom he said, Ho, oh, such a one turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit ye down here. And they sat down. So there's a lot of emphasis on them sitting down. And part of the reason is they want, they want to sit down because they have a transaction that needs to be conducted. And so they're all sitting down to conduct the transaction. But the amazing thing is concerning our kinsman redeemer, he did not sit down until the transaction was finished. It was after he had by himself purged our sins and the transaction was done. And that great transaction where our sin was laid upon him and he was punished as our substitute, uh, that, that, that work of purging our sin forever was dealt with that he sat down on the right hand of the majesty 
on high. The transaction was complete. It was finished. And he sat down after he had completed the work. But here, there's a great emphasis on them sitting down to conduct the business. So he said to the kinsman, uh, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, this is verse three, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. Uh, but if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. And so this uh, nearer kinsman was very willing to at least purchase the land uh, off uh, Naomi uh, for her because she was in dire straits and uh, needed uh, that help. He's willing to take that role. But in verse five, Boaz says, know something that everybody really knew that this was a package deal. It wasn't just one element. There was two elements to it. There was raising up a name for the dead, as well as purchasing the land. And so in verse five, then said Boaz, what day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up, or as it were, to bring back the, the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And so Boaz explained what everybody knew. This is a package deal. If someone was going to excise the right of kinsman redeemer toward the deceased Elimelech, he had to fulfill the duty in regard to both the property and to the posterity so that that name would continue in Israel. And notice his answer in verse 6. The kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself. Now, does he really mean I cannot? He obviously he is a related. He obviously is rich. It's not a question of money, but he's not ready. It really should be better. We might better translate it. I will not. It's not that he couldn't, but he wouldn't. He didn't want to buy the land for the son of a Moabitess. He didn't want to do that. When it was just a matter of property, it was easy to decide on. But if he must take Ruth as wife, that was another matter. That might mar his own inheritance. And he didn't want to do that. He says verse, again in verse 6, uh, Lest I mar mine own inheritance, redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Notice, too, how Boaz has described Ruth. In verse 5, he says, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buyest it also of Ruth the Moabitess. Was the reference to the, the idea of Ruth the Moabitess, was, was that a deliberate strategy on the part of Boaz? Did he hope that it might be a, a deterrent to his kinsmen? He did, after all, want Ruth for himself. Would this near kinsman be afraid of the stigma of Moab? Many think that was the real reason of his unwillingness. Again, what irony. The man who selfishly tried to preserve and protect his inheritance has now gone into oblivion. His name is perished out of Israel. No one, even the most accurate and meticulous of Jewish archivists, has any knowledge of his identity. Usually the rabbis and the missioner and all these, they all have some, uh, you know, kind of solution to these things that the scripture is silent on. They usually have some name, but they don't have any name for this man. He remained forever in obscurity and anonymity. Uh, the name of Boaz, the Moabitess, lives on enshrined, uh, Boaz and the Moabitess live on enshrined in the genealogies of the illustrious King David and the Messiah himself, but the man who's intent on protecting his inheritance disappears from the pages of Scripture. Isn't it interesting that the Word of God says, he who doeth the will of God abides forever. And here's 
Boaz, so willing to do the will of God. He is Ruth the Moabitess, again, willing to do the will of God, and their names are enshrined in biblical history, heard throughout the world, read throughout the world, and appreciated throughout the world, and yet this one man who's so trying to protect himself and his own inheritance, he ends up being the loser. And again, doesn't the Lord Jesus say that if we try to hold on to our life, we lose it? But if we lay down our lives for his sake, <laughs> we're the gainer. And the word of God is so clear on these things. And so we've mentioned before that Boaz is a lovely picture of Jesus Christ, our kinsman redeemer. And this is no exception, the scene we've just looked at. Like Boaz, Jesus wasn't concerned about jeopardizing his own inheritance. Instead, he made us part of his inheritance. And isn't that a wonderful thought that he actually, he, he wants us to be part, to share in his inheritance, not trying to reserve things for self. The book of Ephesians, a uh, great epistle of redemption. And, and again, it tells us in verse 11, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of this calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And so rather than wanting to hold on selfishly, and maintain his own inheritance, he shares his inheritance with us. Oh, what a wonderful, uh, generous, gracious kinsman redeemer we have that wants to pay a, a price uh, to bring us into an inheritance. Like Boaz, Jesus made his plans privately, but he paid the price publicly. He did what he did because of his love, for his bride. So Boaz stepped up and said, since the near kinsman cannot redeem, I will. And that is what our greater than Boaz says concerning us. The Lord Jesus alone has the right to redemption. Nothing else can redeem us. Silver and gold can't redeem us. We can't redeem ourselves. We're so poor, we can't do anything. But he alone has the right to the redemption. And he has the resources for redemption. He purchases us with the, the richness of his own precious blood that flowed on Calvary. And he alone has the reason for redemption. Why does he do it? Well, he does it out of his undeserved, unmerited grace to people like us. And of course, we saw something of the grace of Boaz in chapter three, that this outsider, this Moabitess, that he brought her in and showed kindness to her. And the Lord Jesus, we that were once afar off have been brought near. And finally, Jesus alone can give us rest in redemption. Uh, in our own efforts, there's no rest. We can never, uh, the nation of Israel, because they refuse the kinsman redeemer, what are they doing? They're going about trying to establish their own righteousness and not submitting to the righteousness of God. And so they have no, they have no rest. They've never entered into the rest that is given through redemption. But we have rest in redemption through the Lord Jesus. And so verse 7, now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore, the kinsman said to Boaz, buy it for thee. So he drew off his shoe. Now, again, we need to go back to Deuteronomy chapter 25 concerning this matter of the removal of the shoe. Deuteronomy 25 and verses 9 and 10. And so it says this, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, so shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house and his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him that has his shoe 
loosed. So somebody was not willing to be the kinsman redeemer. He had the resources. He, he was a close relative, but he wouldn't do it. For whatever reason, he refused. Then his shoe were to be, was to be removed. And he would be have somebody would spit. The woman would spit in his face, which was a tremendous reproach. And he would be known from that day forward as uh, the, the house of him that hath his shoe loosed. And so it was, a, it was a terrible ceremony indeed. The deceased brother's wife. Now, again, Ruth wasn't even here. She'd gone home to Naomi. And, and so she wasn't present. Uh, the unnamed kinsman himself voluntarily pulled off his shoe to give to Boaz. There was no need for any further humiliation in the contemptuous spitting in his face prescribed in uh, chapter 25 of Deuteronomy, verse 9 and 10. So what's the significance of the shoe? The shoe is that which treads on the ground, right? And so the idea is this, the custom itself, and it's not just in Israel, it existed amongst uh, the Indians uh, in India, uh, amongst the ancient Germans. Uh, it was a property, uh, was fixed when somebody tread upon the soil and the idea was that when they tread on that soil they were they were basically uh, claiming it for themselves and so when somebody took off the shoe and gave it to another they're handing to another the symbol of a transfer of possession or a right to ownership and remember when the nation of israel were to go into the promised land do you remember how did they how did the transfer of ownership take place well, in Joshua 1, verse 3, the Lord says through Joshua, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. And so the idea is that um, this unknown, unnamed kinsman has now conceded his rights to Boaz by giving him his shoe. And if ever there was any dispute about the land, you know how it was resolved? Well, quite quickly, they just brought out the shoe and said, here, look, <laughs> this, you've given this shoe to me. Now the land is mine. It's my right to walk in that land. And so <clears throat> again, we, we, we think of wherever you put the soles of your feet, that shall be your inheritance. And of course, isn't it interesting that when the Lord Jesus comes back to this earth to claim his inheritance after he's he's got the title deed in Revelation chapter five to planet earth, it says that he comes in Zechariah 14, verse four, it says in that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. What is he doing? He is claiming this world, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God and his Christ. He's laying claim to his rightful inheritance, which is this earth. And so verse nine, it says, and Boaz said to the elders and unto all the people, you are witness, witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Killians and Marlins of the hand of Naomi, Moreover, Ruth the Moabite is the wife of Marlon. I have purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. Notice how Boaz goes about this. He does it in a very clear way. First of all, he claims the land before the witnesses. And he wants to make it clear. Boaz, verse 9, said to all the elders, to all the people, your witnesses this day, I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Killian's and Marlon's of the hand of Naomi. Okay, so he's redeemed the land. That part of it's done. But then he keeps separate this second transaction. And he says, moreover, Ruth the Moabite is the wife of Marlon. I have purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. The name of the dead be not cut off from among 
his brethren, and from the gate of his place, you are witnesses this day. And so he, he doesn't do it all in the same breath. He's not saying, I bought the land and I got the woman. That's not what he's saying. He wants to show the importance of the, the acquiring of this wife and the dignity of it all. He, he has acquired Ruth, uh, the Moabites. The wife in Jewish law was regarded in, in a very high esteem. She was seen as a partner in the sacred duty of building up a home. She's not just some chattel that's purchased, but she's, she's seen as part of uh, that partnership to build up a home for God. It's only here, by the way, that we learn that Ruth was the wife of Marlon. We know that there were two widows and we know there were two husbands, but the details of who married who is given us here. Ruth was the wife of Marlon. And so Boaz pays the redemption price for the land and his bride. And of course, it's a wonderful foreshadowing of Messiah, the Redeemer. What a price he has paid to purchase his bride and to recover the creation from which man forfeited by his disobedience. And again, the Lord Jesus. Redemption is much bigger than just redeeming a people but it's also redeeming the land back to God as well. And part of the redemptive work of Christ, it won't be complete until this earth, this planet is back under divine ownership completely and the usurper is dealt with. Just an, an aside here that I think is very important for us to understand is why a marriage ceremony and a marriage license is important. You see, there's a mentality today is, well, as long as you just, you know, married in the sight of God, it doesn't matter about all this public thing. You know, as long as you love each other, you know, you can. And so a lot of people today are, uh, are not bothering going through any wedding ceremony. They're just living together as what we call common law husband and wife. But <clears throat> there's something severely lacking in a love that doesn't want to proclaim itself. So this is a public declaration, really. He is making a public declaration that I am purchasing for me Ruth the Moabitess to be my wife. It, this is a very public thing. I want to be publicly known as the one that has taken this woman uh, to be my wife. Uh, and it falls short of true marital love just to live together. Now, some people say this, well, if you were on a desert island and no one was there to marry us, uh, could we still be married before God? And you hear all this kind of stuff. Well, let me just say this. You're not on a desert island. <laughs> you're, you're not living on a desert island. You're, 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 you're in a society where there are witnesses and there are civil authorities for you to proclaim your commitment of marital love. And God wants us to do this. Contrary to what some people believe, marriage is not a private affair. The sacred union includes God and God's people, and every bride and groom should want the blessing of God and God's people on their marriage. It's a public testimony to taking this person to be your wife, and certainly Boaz wants to make sure that there are witnesses. You are witnesses this day and certainly not ashamed. And so the people that were in the gate, verse 11, and the elders said, we are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which two did build the house of Israel and do thou worthily in Ephrathah, and be famous in Bethlehem. Now, just a couple of thoughts here before we wrap up this morning. First of all, remember Rachel and Leah. They were from outside the land of Israel. Remember that? You remember how Jacob left the land of promise and he went to uh, out uh, into uh, Syria, uh, Laban the Syrian, and brought back two brides, Rachel and Leah, and through them built up the house of Israel. And so what the request is that 
Ruth also, who was from outside the land, who was being bought, brought back, she would build up once again the land of Israel. And this term Ephratha, used in connection with Bethlehem, is an interesting uh, uh, term. It, it, it has the significant meaning of being fruitful. And the people wanted Ruth to be fruitful and famous and to bring honor on their little town. It was a place where Rachel was buried. But more importantly, it would be the place that would be known as the place where Jesus was born. And so certainly this place would become a fruitful place. Every believer in the Lord Jesus loves to sing of the Redeemer. I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love for me. The amazing thing is that the expression, my Redeemer, is a very rare expression in Scripture. We often sing it, and certainly the truth of redemption is not rare, but the actual term, my Redeemer, is used twice in the Word of God. Job 19, verse 25, where Job makes that wonderful statement, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And of course, that's the word goel, our famous word. The other one is Psalm 19 and verse 14, where David talks about the meditation of his heart to be acceptable in thy sight, my God and my Redeemer. And so certainly how thankful we are that we had a Redeemer who became our kinsman, taking on flesh that he might redeem us. And so he was related. He took on flesh and blood. And then he was rich. He could pay the price, the redemption price. And then he was ready. He was willing to pay that price for us. And how thankful we should be and how we should be willing to say this morning, I will sing of my Redeemer and his wondrous love for me. I hope we're thankful that we have such a marvelous Redeemer this morning. Amen.